Welcome to PCR Studio. I'm Dr. Khalid Rashebi from Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, and I have with me here today Dr. Sajda Khan from uh, Durban, South Africa, and Dr. Tom Cusset from Marseille, France. We're here to discuss today the uh, pharmacoinvasive strategy and how it's applied with the worldwide uh, perspective. Uh, I'll start with Dr. Cusset. We all know that the gold standard for uh, treatment of ST elevation myocardial infarction is a primary PCI, yet we know there are constraints when this is applied worldwide. Could you please elaborate? Yeah, uh, it's true that primary PCI has been described as the gold standard strategy for reperfusion in STEMI, in STEMI patients, but we know that primary PCI is not achievable for many reasons in different parts of the world. And for all these local constraints and for these reasons, today, pharmacoinvasive strategy is the first option used in the world for reperfusion in STEMI patients. Very interesting. Dr. Sajda, you are from Durban, South Africa. Uh, could you describe, given the local constraints in your community, how patients are usually treated when they present with ST elevation myocardial infarction? Oh, we've got to recognize primarily that if any condition is time dependent in terms of outcomes and prognosis, it is ST elevation. And uh, in order to have the ideal treatment, you have to have cath labs available as well as interventional cardiologists ready at hand. Uh, but we have to recognize that the first port of call for most patients is not an interventional cardiologist or not a PCI hospital and time dependency being so important this is an option that is not available for just about all the patients that we see so we got to think of alternatives if we are going to impact on outcomes and so how how is the patient uh, usually treated do they usually get lytic therapy it's uh, initially as a primary strategy the only reperfusion strategy that is uh, you know acceptable in the mandated timelines often mm. is uh, lytic therapy but having said that even lysis is not always available at the port of first call mm. so so using aspirin or, or, or just a low molecular weight heparin or dual antiplatelet therapy, even that is better than nothing. Okay. But so uh, primarily it's fibrinolysis. So primarily fibrinolysis and patients are subsequently referred uh, to a tertiary centre and this may be delayed uh, hours or maybe even days on well, occasions. Certainly, because it's not only dependent uh, on the cath lab facility, but you need to have an ICU bed, you need to have an interventionalist available. And the transport is not, it's not a state mandated therapy. It is an individual ad hoc therapy. Okay. So if you're dependent on state health care, as the majority of patients are, you've just got to wait your turn. Okay. Dr. Cassette, let me get back to you. Is there any evidence now that would support such a uh, uh, default strategy that is forced upon them by their circumstances? Yeah, it's a very important point because we know that the cardiovascular community used to to base everything on evidence-based medicine. And the pharmacoinvasive strategy in STEMI is clearly supported by strong evidence. First, we have evidence showing that pharmacoinvasive strategy, meaning lytics followed by cat lab, is better than lytics alone. We have also evidence showing or suggesting that pharmacoinvasive strategy is probably almost as good as primary PCI in patients with prolonged delay, especially patients, the early presenter, Patient coming to us early within the first hours from symptom onset. So yes, we have strong evidence supporting the use of pharmacoinvasive strategy. And we have also evidence to determine the timing of the cat lab after successful lytics. And we know that today the window between three and 24 hours is probably the most appropriate for STEMI patient with successful lytics. Very good. So there is evidence for what is generally practiced uh, in the literature that would tell us that uh, a pharmacoinvasive strategy such as that, uh, that Dr. Sajda has described here is uh, supported. Exactly. Uh, but I guess there is an increased risk of bleeding when you embark upon such a strategy and perform an invasive procedure very shortly after uh, lytic therapy. Uh, Dr. Khan, can you please tell us how we could minimize these risks? I have to say at the beginning, um, although we've got to be cognizant 
of the factors that can increase bleeding. Don't let that be the overriding factor to actually negate using the lytic therapy. Because often in the circumstances that people find themselves when they are junior practitioners practicing alone, when the burden of responsibility of accepting that the bleeding risk becomes excessive for detrimental effects, sometimes it makes the individual practitioner reticent to actually embark. So primarily, that is an important fact to consider. But let's but assume the patient got the lytic therapy okay. and but is having now said transferred, that, yes. Certainly. Uh, uh, if you've had, what? for me, the real contraindication is you have, if you've had a neurological condition such as a recent stroke in the preceding uh, six months or head trauma or some undetected problem. That is a real contraindication. So and there are other minor... In the cath lab, for instance, or, or once the patient gets to you, uh, to further reduce the risks. Oh, certainly, you know, you got to be very conscious of dosage. You got to be very conscious of the combination of drugs. You got to be conscious of uh, those patients who have a greater propensity to bleed, especially the elderly above the age of 75 or renal impairment, or perhaps the elderly female who is underweight. And um, there are some tried and tested combination of regimens that we know are safe. So if you adhere to that, that is, uh, really reduces your risk. And for the interventionalist, obviously going via the radial route, uh, you know, helps uh, us in Anything reducing Anything else you'd like risk. to add, Dr. Kisset? Now following the reduction of the bleeding risk, it's also very important if you have a patient with successful lytics, the, the vessel is open. It's very important not to send the patient directly to the cat lab because you will end up with arterial puncture, PCI, just have to lytics. And in this specific situation, we know that we will increase both ischemic but also bleeding risk. So I think this time window should be really respected. That's very important. Great, thank you very much.